Well, welcome everybody. Um, good to see you all, as I said. Um, I don't think anyone joined since, but this is the RPL um, workshop, um, which we're all looking forward to. My name is Alastair Delaney. I'm the Deputy Chief Executive of QAA. Um, and QAA is one of the founding uh, partners, if you like, of the SUKF partnership. So we're very, very supportive, um, obviously, of the SUKF partnership. It's my job to bring order to chaos. And by that, I mean, introduce people, keep everybody to time uh, and manage the questions. My ask of you is that if you could use the chat to indicate any questions that you've got, um, and we, I will collate those up and we'll, I will use them with the remaining time that we have. Obviously, we must finish at 12.50 to allow everyone a chance to go and uh, stretch their legs and, and have some lunch. So, to this workshop, um, I think we all agree the importance of RPL, and we've heard a lot about that in the, uh, the introductory presentations already. Um, but it's especially important where there's greater movement happening, whether it's people between jobs or across boundaries, the development of micro-credentials and smaller packets of learning. So it's all really uh, important to get this right um, and to get it working as a proper system. And this workshop is going to showcase some of the work that the partnership has undertaken in partnership with others and helping three specific groups that I'm really interested to, to, to hear about. And that is apprentices, veterans or uh, um, uh, forces veterans and refugees and migrants. Each speaker is going to give us 10 minutes of an overview of their work and please as I said put questions in the chat as they occur to you they won't be lost but what I'm going to do is run all the three presentations um, so 30 minutes in the first instance and then we will open it up for questions at the end and discussion um, that's just to make sure that we have enough time uh, for everyone. Um, so please um, help us to make this one of the best workshops you've ever ever been to. I have three presenters um, today. Uh, the first is Julie Kavanagh, who is the Head of Partnerships and Communication at SEQF Partnership. I've also got Karen Murray, who is the Head of Work-Based Learning Quality Delivery at SDS, Skills Development Scotland. And lastly, but not least, I've got Emma Jackson, who is the Project Lead at Skills Recognition Scotland. Um, so we're really looking forward to hearing from our contributors today. But first of all, we're going to start with Julie. And Julie is going to talk to us a bit about the work that the partnership has undertaken with Armed Forces Veterans. Over to you, Julie. Thanks very much, Alistair. Um, what I'm going to do is just share my screen so you can see my um, presentation. Just bear with me, back to the beginning. There we go. Hopefully everyone can see that. If anyone can't, please just um, pop in the chat. Um, and I'm just going to run through um, our project that we've been working on with veterans in terms of recognition of veterans qualifications. I'm also going to do a very quick run through of the tool that we've recently developed as well. So um, we started this project. Um, we were asked by the Scottish Funding Council to look at the um, simplifying the current system for mapping and translating qualifications gained in the military. This was on the back of the um, Veterans Commissioner for Scotland's report um, into employability and skills, um, which was really focusing on looking at how we would attract veterans to settle in Scotland and how we would make their lives easier. And obviously employability and skills was extremely important in terms of helping them um, transition out of the military into a civilian role. So um, this particular project, the benefits really um, of making sure that they understood their skills and particularly their qualifications, um, really the benefits was, of that was to help them understand it better, what they have actually gained, because um, the military work on primarily on an English system and they use the English qualification system and the English qualifications framework. So we wanted to, them to be able to understand what they've gained here, um, in their, in their um, time in the military and be able to articulate that to um, both employers and if they want to go into further learning, then learning providers in Scotland. So it was really a better understanding of their own qualifications by both themselves, by employers and education providers, and start to help them think about possible future choices, knowing what the skills um, are that they have. 
So because we started in 2018, we knew nothing about the um, about the, the um, military at all. Uh, and so there was a big learning curve for us, which was quite interesting. Um, certainly we had the backing of um, Scottish government on this project and the MOD were hugely supportive as well. And what we had to do is really decide where we wanted to start. We'd had people in the past approach us from the military wanting to look at doing something similar, but this job was a big job. Um, when we looked at it, there were about 1,235 qualifications um, that were already currently being delivered across all three of the armed forces. So what we needed to do was consult on priorities and we talked to key stakeholders with the support of uh, somebody from the military who we uh, was acting as a consultant for us. We looked at particularly non-trades. We felt that trades, uh, people who were perhaps electricians or engineers or chefs, probably had a good understanding of what they'd already gained. And so would people, uh, civilian employers as well. So we looked at what we call non-trades people, for instance, in infantry, who were out there on the front line in, in certain war zones, etc., and obviously have a huge wealth of skills, but perhaps find it difficult to actually articulate what those are. Our first our first job was to um, develop a range of different information leaflets, um, looking at um, mapping qualifications um, for each what we call cap badge across to um, the SEQF from the RQF. So we, we did that for a number of the cap badges, starting with Army, and we dedicate we also developed a dedicated web page as well. And we, we did find we get a lot of. Um, queries and, and questions about qualifications from uh, service leaders, which was really um, promising. Um, we also looked at the MOD's qualifications matrix because there were a number of anomalies with that and, and some inaccuracies. And we spent a lot of time um, getting that accurate and making sure that um, the information was current. We also gave a lot of support to uh, staff who were supporting people leaving the armed forces in the form of workshops and webinars. And we had a ministerial launch of all that in September, 2019. One of the things we discovered was that um, a lot of the time when we were talking to people, it was all about this recognition of skills and the ability to articulate it. Plus we felt we really needed to develop some kind of sustainable approach to all this going forward. So uh, we'd had some discussions just before lockdown and developed some um, PDFs and simple things to, to assist, but it wasn't really hitting the mark. And so we had some further discussions with the MOD. And at that point, Skills Development Scotland were putting into place a number of changes to their, uh, to the My World of Work um, website. And My World of Work, um, hopefully you will all know is the I suppose the central go-to for careers, information, advice and guidance in Scotland. And SDS is the main skills body supporting that in Scotland. Um, Scottish government were also in a position to support us at that point. And so the three things came together and we agreed with Skills Development Scotland that we would develop a mapping tool for qualifications for people within the armed forces that was linked to something called the skills discovery tool, which was already um, within my world of work and help people understand their skills better. And so this would mean that people would be able to understand what they've gained in terms of their qualifications, but also it's an easier way to keep it current. And we were able to look at um, the top 20 job roles that were settling in Scotland. Um, when, when we looked at top 20 job roles, we found that um, and we have the support of Careers Transition Partnership, CTP, for that. Um, we found that we were actually hitting quite a number of the qualifications that were be being delivered across all three of the armed forces. What I want to do is just give you a very quick look at this um, so that you can see it. And if you just bear with me. Um, there we go. Hopefully you can all see now the skills dis uh, discovery tool. And if you can't, please just let me know. So what I want to do is just show you this. This sits within my world of work. Um, and 
basically anyone can uh, access the skills discovery tool within my world of work. However, if you put in a, um, an armed forces role, then what will happen is it takes you to a further section, which is about qualifications. So if I just put in army here, what then comes up is a number of different army uh, job roles and I'm looking for warrant officer. So I add this job. Okay, and then I want to search for uh, a cat badge. So I'm gonna search for the Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers. And if you just pop that in, it comes up so I can add that in. And if I press continue, what then happens is we get about 65 qualifications. If I hadn't, you can hone this down. So if you just put army in, for instance, you come up with about 265 qualifications. So it's important to kind of be as specific as possible. And then what I'm able to do is choose something. So when it says, for instance, the common to everyone, that's, that's qualifications in the armed forces that everybody undertakes. So functional skills is, again, it's, it's an English-based qualification. When it says level two, that's the RQF level. So what I would do is click on that, and then I would have a look. Everybody within the armed forces does some form of leadership and management. So I'm going to go to a level three, which is SCQF level six. And then I'm going to just put in something that would be um, a mechanical engineering, an HND, which is a level eight on the SCQF. Okay. Okay, and then what comes up is a skills report. And this is broken down, this is linked to um, the uh, meta skills within um, Skills Development Scotland. But where it really is split down into self-management, social intelligence and innovation. So when you have a look at, say, self-management, it shows, for instance, a 98% match around adaptability, reflecting, say, just 29%. That doesn't mean the individual can't reflect. It just means that the job role doesn't see that as a priority. So it, it may be that person is perfectly capable of doing that, but the qualifications that they've gained and the skills they've gained, actually reflection isn't perhaps high, high on that list. But that gives you an idea of self-management. And actually they can save the results of that as well if they sign in. And that can all be used towards a, a CV, which is really helpful. What you also get if you're um, in the military or have been in the military is their qualification comparison. So for instance, when you look at the functional skills uh, qualification in maths at level two, that shows it's broadly comparable to SCQF level five. And it shows you other qualifications that sit at that same level that may well be recognized by the individual. Mm. When you see the HND, um, for instance, you'll see that's comparable to level eight and you'll see other qualifications that sit at that level. So that, gives you an idea of the qualifications tool, um, uh, just a very quick run through. What I'm just going to do is go back to my presentation and just explain our next steps. So we're just in the process of finalising a report for Scottish Government. We've done a lot of testing of this with um, service leavers and it's gone, we, we've made already a number of changes to it and improvements. There may well be more to do, but it's certainly getting easier for people to find what they need. Um, we're going to look at how the tool remains current, so that's something we have to agree, and develop a promotional campaign going forward. Um, because obviously we need to promote this. So there's certain a lot of work that we still need to do. But that's really just kind of finalizes that particular presentation and um, just gives you a little overview of that piece of work which has been going on for a while. I'll just stop sharing now. Thank you. Sorry, um, I. 
clicked a button and ended up opening the start menu instead of changing mute because when you move from the slideshow, <laughs> gave myself more more problems than I imagined. Um, so thank you very much, Julian. Obviously, we'll come back and and explore that with questions and a little bit uh, uh, further even. Um, and please, can I encourage people to put questions in the chat? So now we move on to Karen Murray from SDS. Want to talk about the Apprentice Transition Programme? Um, over to you, Karen. Thank you. Thank you, Alistair. And afternoon, everyone. I, um, I see we're after 12 o'clock, so I'll, I'll try and trot through as quickly as I can to give Emma some time um, at the end. So, um, yes, I'm going to talk about the Apprentice Transition Plan service that we developed. Um, we developed this service um, during uh, COVID. Um, so back in March 2020, hmm. um, when the pandemic hit, um, apprentice, there was a lot of apprentices on their way to completing their apprenticeship. For Loki men, we, we thought we were going to have huge numbers of redundancies because of the pandemic, which I know um, certainly um, from what, what actually transpired, that didn't actually come to pass and um, the, the labour market took a, a very different approach. Um, however, we were we were very keen that apprentices um, that hadn't managed to finish their apprenticeship that were made redundant and perhaps couldn't be replaced into another apprenticeship were able to capture their learning um, and and be able to articulate. So, in line with what Julie was saying, that the apprentices were were putting themselves really um, at the forefront of the job market, that they were able to articulate the skills that they developed, and also um, be able to kind of um, transfer those skills into a, a sort of C, CV, um, despite the fact they hadn't completed everything within within their apprenticeship. So, so this is why we, we developed the Apprentice Transition Plan service. Um, so what it was, was um, we, we did say that, you know, apprentices, modern apprentices anyway, should be employed status first and foremost. What we did say was if the assessment strategy allowed within the, the apprenticeship um, qualification, um, then some of those apprentices could complete their apprenticeship without it being um, a, a employed status, um, if, if the resourcing allowed that to happen. The other thing that we did was, was provide them with um, a, a record of all of the certificated learning they had to date. So if they didn't complete their certificate completely, that they had a, something that said, here's all the things that you have been certificated for. But also, because a lot of apprenticeships are delivered in a holistic way, what we find is a lot of learners will have developed little bits of things, but wouldn't have managed to get their whole qualification. So we were really keen to be able to provide them with a record of their transferable skills. But the important thing for us was to make sure that that was quality assured. And that's where benchmarking, that's where um, the RPL processes became important to us. So we wanted to benchmark them um, to the, uh, um, the SCQF um, and, and also provide the learner with a, a statement sort of saying, Here's all the here are what all these um, skills that um, I've developed are, um, and and say them in a concise way. The things that weren't coming across in, in official certification, and the final thing of it was that we wanted our providers to support those um, people on to the next stage um, of their learner journey by providing them information, help, and guidance. So. Um, we kind of designed the service in five stages um, and, and we asked our training providers um, to, to step up to the plate and deliver this. So stage four is the bit that I think that we are mostly interested in and in, in terms of how did we manage to undertake RPL for those uncertificated elements and record them within um, a record of achievement. Um, and, and so that's the bit that I kind of really wanted to see a bit more about for people um, in, in relation to how it worked. 
Um, so um, what we did do was we utilised um, the employer um, handbook, so the, the themes of the employer handbook, and we, we asked our providers to, to um, collate all the, learn, all the information about what that learner had achieved um, and ask them some questions as well. And then almost doing a kind of um, benchmarking approach using the employer toolkit, the uh, providers were asked to benchmark against the criteria of the employer toolkit, the RPL, um, as opposed to the, the normal SCQF5 criteria, we used the employer um, areas. And that was then recorded in a, a certain, what we called a, a record of achievement. Um, there was a number of challenges. Um, so obviously the, the predicting redundancy um, was um, wrong. We were completely wrong. And in actual fact, um, we had a massive decrease. Um, I think it's actually down a little bit more. We seem to be creeping up a wee bit with redundancy now, but redundancy rates actually decreased by 75%. So um, that was a, a huge challenge. It was a real positive for the learners because they actually got to complete their apprenticeships. Um, uh, but but it, it didn't give us that opportunity to um, uh, deliver the ATP the, the way we wanted to. However, um, we did train 150 assessors um, which, which was across, we have maybe a, around 240 providers that SDS contract with to deliver apprenticeships. That represented 41 of our providers. Now, given that in the past, and Ema will talk about how um, uh, for the, the um, asylum seeker service, um, the, the training was face-to-face, -face. we had to develop and pretty quickly an approach to Develop, um, train providers in delivering this service and being able to use to be able to use SCQF and benchmark um, um, and do that online and with a, a large number of people. Um, so, um, what we our, our outcomes have been is we've actually only had four apprentices completing the process. We've had really good feedback on those four apprentices and they have developed a record of achievement, which is they've created themselves this um, certificate, which also through the, the process of developing it, they can articulate how um, they can articulate the skills that they've got, but they've also got almost got like a, a quality assured CV at the end of it. And so they are very happy with the process that, that they went through. I think though the big success for us has been that the providers really understood, started to really understand the use of the SCQF for benchmarking and using that to create you know, as a quality assured process to gain RPL for individuals, because I think RPL has always been quite complex for them in the past. And so that has really given us a way of making sure that we've got robust processes to do this um, activity. And I suppose the other um, positive is we have now embedded this in our ask of all providers. So going forward, any apprentice made redundant that can't be replaced in back into the, um, the system with another employer, what we're saying is, as a provider, we're expecting you to deliver that service or to refer to another provider that will deliver. And we've, we've written that into our uh, contract for apprentices going forwards. What we have learned from this, and, and this is one of the areas that I think is quite exciting around all our, our activity and using this, is we've started to use that, that concept of benchmarking against the SCQF um, to think about the, um, the, the new apprenticeship frameworks. I saw earlier, there was quite a lot of discussion around meta skills. And what we're talking about meta skill delivery and apprenticeships is um, using SCQF benchmarking um, to um, 
assess the level of reflection that apprentice has about their own meta skill development. So what we're seeing in apprenticeships going forward in the new design rules is that it's not about competence of your meta skills, it's about your ability to articulate where you are with the meta skills and also to um, for the assessor to be able to say how well they've reflected um, on their meta skills development. So we've taken a lot of those principles that we've learned from working with SCQF partnership to develop these RPL processes and, and, and are utilising them now um, to, um, to uh, assess meta skill reflection and, and we're building that into the new apprenticeship frameworks as, as we're going forward. And that final um, box on the right hand side there is how we are, um, how we've set that out and it's, it, there's quite a, a clear process for that. And providers, because they've used the ATP service and they've trained in it, they understand the concepts really quite well. And so it, it makes it easier for us to create a, a robust way of delivering meta skills. Obviously, all this still has to be tried out, but um, it's certainly an exciting development for us in, in SDS. So that's me. I'm going to stop sharing and hand back um, for Ema's presentation. Thanks, Karen. Um, really interesting and good to see something being tried out and then embedded across uh, you know, everything that you do in future. That's really, really positive. Um, but before we get to the questions, um, welcome to, to Ema, um, who's going to talk to us a bit about the Skills Recognition Scotland programme. Welcome, Ema. Hello, um, everybody, and thanks for coming today to listen to this session about um, uh, recognition of prior learning. Um, I'm going to just reflect on, I'm the project lead for this initiative. I actually don't usually work in the skills sector, so um, the way that I come to this is someone who is building infrastructure with government and in research about how we develop infrastructure that meets the needs of those who are marginalised by the system uh, that we have in, usually in process because it doesn't recognize the direction that they come to it. And so people who have migrated to Scotland very often don't have access to the usual structures that we have in place to support um, such as apprenticeships um, or um, <clears throat> process because we're relatively new to migration in Scotland and our systems have generally been built, built to accommodate those who were born here and brought up here. So yeah, so Skills Recognition Scotland, I'm going to tell you a bit about it. Um, next slide, please. So all of Scotland's projected uh, population increase, I'm just going to give some wider context, is to net migration. Yeah. So Scotland does not have, Scotland has a falling demographic, I think everybody knows. And we also have a quite an unhealthy older population. And those are not necessarily good things. And so in a way to mitigate that and to keep our country, our population growing and healthy, and as is related to that, obviously our economy, we have to develop policies and processes. The main one is migration to encourage people to come. There is no sort of encourage, although we're trying to improve the benefits for people who want to become parents and uh, have better, healthier lives and able to do that. Actually, our main policy driver is to encourage people to come to Scotland in order to feed into our economy and to help us grow and sustain ourselves into the future. So, next slide. Building this infrastructure. So, Skills Recognition Scotland is actually a national process based on the um, processes of recognition of prior learning that um, helps employers understand the transferability of skills of those who migrate. migrate. 
employer people who move around the world um have historically uh been end up not having their skills recognized employers don't necessarily know or trust the systems of recognition uh, companies are very used to bringing people directly from overseas that's one thing but if people are already here or in the rest of the UK and not really sure how people's skills transfer into the labour market and into their skills need in their company and organisation. So when I've been kind of around this for a very long time, but um, and originally it was sort of when more migration around 2002 or so, but not hugely focused on it. I did set up an initiative then, but around 2014, around the independence, there were some really serious conversations with government about how is Scotland going to position itself as a small independent country that people who come here um, have their skills recognized, get able to work at the level that they should work at. And so we don't have, as is historically, often globally, to be honest, that people who migrate, say you're an engineer or a scientist or a lawyer or a doctor, you end up working in cleaning, in uh, taxi driving and uh, whatever, whatever. So you don't, so that's historically what happens. Some countries are really good about this, have developed amazing um, systems. Germany and Canada are kind of the leaders. Scotland was up there <laughs> about, um, had done some really good work around recognition of prior learning, early 2000s, SCQF, all these um, amazing things. That they, but it was really hard to get it sort of um, into actually be functioning. So... Brexit, so, so a lot of chart around the sort of independence, but it didn't actually come to anything. Around 2018, Brexit's kind of looming. And there was, again, serious consideration by government about what are we going to do about for our employers, for them to be able to recognize and understand the transferability of skills of those who come from overseas. So basically, Brexit has compounded that thinking and now we, so for the last just over two years now, just before, a year before, three years before the pandemic, we've been working in what has now become Skills Recognition Scotland. Next slide. The roots of the system of Skills Recognition Scotland, which ultimately takes the expertise of someone who's worked in another country and maps it through the employer leveling tool to the Scottish qualifications framework and when I said I would not really in this world I the, I did not know how important the CQF was in this system and that is actually it's kind of the envy of many of the other countries because it's easy to map your qualifications you know NARIC National Association of Records now ENIC or whatever uh, you can map that but that doesn't actually look at the skills that people have. That's the qualifications that you have. So as the currency around qualifications kind of, see, in my opinion, seems to, not being of this world, seems to be less focused on the qualifications and more on the actual skills and expertise that you have, the SCQF has been really fundamental so, to the system that we've built. What we built, next slide, please. With, so we need recognize that we need something better. We needed to put in a system for Scotland that recognizing the skills that went beyond the form of qualifications. Very often the people who made great, or certainly the people we've been working with over the last few years are highly, highly qualified. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they get that recognized into the job that they would be able to get. So it took an experience of the developed in the work workplace over the years and sometimes it, if experience it couldn't be nationally supported by documentary uh, evidence it was not a system it is a system that does not predicate it on the formal demonstration of skills it's not based on an academic model and an end in itself the recognition is needed for something else which is for employment next slide please 
I'm not really going to go through this, but this is the process. Step one is from orientation. Step six is applying uh, this whole process into getting a job. Step six is getting the employment in the area around the level that you should have. What we have built over the last couple of years, next slide, I think, is the process, right? So the process uh, integrates evidence of formal learning, example of the qualification. So if you've done a degree, say you're an engineer from, or a pharmacist, we've worked so much with pharmacists over the last, which who we happened to meet a group of self-presenting pharmacists just before lockdown. And they've been uh, really helpful as a group to help us formalize the whole process. So it integrates evidence of formal learning. That means that we can assess as a kind of hub, the skills recognition hub, uh, what were your formal qualifications, um, your degrees, your professional uh, uh, expertise. It's really important that everyone who knows this, this, we are not giving professional registration. This is not about if you're a pharmacist and you want to gain um, professional registration as a pharmacist in Scotland, in the UK, we do not do that. That is, there's a set process as there is for doctors, for scientists, for what it, we can direct you how to do that, where to go to get that. So really, uh, these are really difficult processes. Um, but we are mapping the expertise that you had in your job. So say if you're a community pharmacist in Iran, what was your job? What, what level of uh, expertise did you, where did you operate at? Were you in charge of 20 other staff? Were you in charge? Were someone in charge of you? What were you running? What was your levels of skills? What, what was your, you know, the sort of governance that you fed into? What was your um, role? And, and, and uh, you demonstrate that. So you're, you're assigned an, an advisor who's been trained by us with the support of SCQF about how to become benchmarkers. So you're assigned a benchmarker. If you present to the um, process, the skills recognition process, you're assigned an advisor who then supports you through that process. And they are, um, there's a whole really formal, robust quality assurance process about who's the advisor, what's the process, and how do you um, determine that the level that the person's come out with. So that's a whole massive thing that's been ratified by everybody involved. And we've had Scottish Enterprise, Scottish Skills Development Scotland, um, obviously SCQF, absolutely fundamental to this, as well as migrant organisations or well, the people about that process, like that is the process for Scotland. So over the last two years, we have done that. Really happy with that process. It's working really well. We have not launched yet because we wanted to make it work really well. So we have not launched yet, um, but we will do this year. <laughs> um, yeah, and we're actually at this stage, so this last one, uh, contextualized for employers. We're working really hard this next year with employers so they understand what this is that people come out with. Like, what is this process that you've now, Scotland's now accepted and putting in place. So that's where we're actually at. It's building trust of employers and, and understanding, although they've been involved all along, just to start um, using it more confidently. Next slide. Yes, so I should maybe said that what it is talking about informal skills, translating experience gained in other countries into the language of skills in Scotland, enabling people who migrate to articulate their skills for a, job, a Scottish job market, to recognise transferability, employers to understand more clearly what skills gained in other countries can mean for them. And I think that's kind of the key part of what we have to do, I would say at this point, having built the process, understanding the skills landscape. We're completely cross-sector now. We did start off with sort of three or four um, targeted sectors, but the whole sector landscape has changed because of the pandemic. So now we're um, 
yeah we're just everyone and anyone can with whatever skills next slide please i think we're just about done so this is where we come using the skills the seqf um, the knowledge and under the different descriptors and people come out with a level and they get a one page two sided document which maps for the employer where their both their where their formal qualifications are where their language is level is at we map that to the European standard and then the second page of that and I actually don't have I don't think on the slide the um where they map to, what levels they map to. So what levels of the communication, what levels, degrees of autonomy, et cetera, et cetera. And then the employer can see that they have evidenced where they have been functioning in their roles. Next slide, I think that's maybe it, is it? Yes. <laughs> so hopefully that's a bit of a run through, but uh, hopefully that makes sense of where we're at. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ima. That was really, really interesting. And um, I'm sure lots of people will have some, some thoughts about it. Um, three really interesting and diverse contributions there, colleagues, um, in relation to RPL. Um, and certainly it sparked a lot of thinking for me about um, different elements. We have five minutes or so for some questions, a little bit more than that. Um, and sorry, I'm can I? Up... I'm sorry, Alistair, this is not the form. Someone just thought that quite absolutely saying, is this for everyone? This was built out of migration, but it's actually for everybody. It's just started there. So I sorry, I meant to say that this is for women returners, people with chaotic lives. I sorry, I, I, it's so just to clarify that it started with migration because migration forces change, but the process is to be used for everyone. And that was always intended. Thank you. We'll, we'll, don't worry, we'll pick up these questions in the chat uh, by going around. The first question that somebody posed earlier, Julie, I'm going to come to you first, um, just about saying, do you know if the MOD had similar discussions with other home nations or has this been um, a Scotland only developed thing? Um, no, uh, not yet. So um, it was originally a Scotland um, developed thing because it was felt that we could, we were the ideal, um, I suppose, starting point to try this out as a pilot. So we've actually had further discussions um, with the MOD just this week, actually, um, to talk about what they may want to do next, whether they just keep it as something for Scotland. Um, but I think there is a thought and there's, there's some um, quite strong interest in rolling it out across the whole of the UK. So it, I don't know how that would work. It's probably slightly beyond our remit. It'll be an MOD um, project, I guess, an MOD led project, but it's possible. There's just discussion at the moment, early discussion, but it may well be that it goes through the last step. Very good, thank you. And Karen, um, you'll have seen one of the questions in the, in the chat saying that um, you're only four completing the process, which on the one side is a good thing because you didn't have lots of uh, apprentices being thrown out of, of employment, which is great. But on the flip side, is there an issue about, I suppose, the input side? You know, where are employers and apprenticeships now? Is there a good flow through or is that reduced in terms of the availability? Um, I mean, at this point in time, um we're just about to, to um, finish the financial year, but we we uh, published our quarter three stats, and they were they were back up to sort of um, seventy percent of the, the the levels they were at uh, pre pandemic. Um, so there's a lot there's a lot of apprentices going through. I mean, we are quite frustrated to be to be absolutely honest about not being able to test the process that we developed which maybe I should have made it a, a bit clearer that it, they were built on the principles of, of what was being done through EMA's work and, and that and that piece of work we, we kind of built this this process on that on that uh, principle um, and you know we really the the providers um, really stepped up to the plate in terms of training and they were all ready to go and it's one of those things where you kind of need to do it to to understand how well it works. So 
Um, that's the bit for us that's slightly frustrating is that we're we're not actually getting a, a chance to test it, but we've had a lot of really positive feedback from the providers about, you know, this is because in the past, I think most people in the call would probably agree that trying to implement RPL has always been a bit too laborious and uh, you hear time and time again, oh, just make them do the assessments again um and and i think for the first time we're starting to get a process as well that 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 this you know that that could be streamlined and utilized to stop that happening um, and people to be able to use it properly so i'm just i'm keen to be able to use these principles in different ways and, and really test them out because to be fair, I don't think we have tested them out fully, but um, uh, as you say, it's a good thing in, in a lot of ways. Um, redundancy numbers are just really low. Yeah, I'm sure you don't want to, to have any more redundancy so that you can <laughs> no, test, uh, yeah, test, yeah. test the program anymore. But, uh, yeah. but yeah, it will happen, I'm no doubt, in, in due course. Um, but it's an interesting point you make about how complicated and time-consuming sometimes the RPL processes have been. Um, and, so, you know, and I think that, that any um, move to make that easier uh, for people to engage with, particularly groups like what we're talking about here, is really, really interesting. Uh, I'm interested, Dima, as well in you. There's a couple of things I would like to ask, but I'll, given time, I'll ask one to begin with. I'm interested in the reaction of employers. How receptive have employers been to this initiative um, and, and their, I suppose their willingness to recognise the skills um, and experience of people coming from uh, other countries? Employers have been really enthused, grateful, supportive. There is no, there's, there. they know what they need. This is employer, like, I'm very, if anyone takes away, and if this is not for, it is obviously based on the experience of people who come to Scotland, but actually it's for the economy. And it's actually built for employers. And they are very grateful because they know that they, are missing a trick around who's here. They haven't been able to understand the transferability of skills. They haven't really been able to trust the process for people who come from overseas, which is why you end up with people not being given jobs at the level that they're, these are, you know, fundamentally, this is the systemic barriers to people who migrate for a host of reasons. And here is a government endorsed process to help employers stop doing that basically. And to demonstrate to people who come from overseas that Scotland will respect your skills and the expertise that you bring. And so if we're gonna open and you know we're performing in this way, here's a great process to kind of herald how you're going to be treated in Scotland. We actually have people, we haven't even launched yet, we have people who've moved, pharmacists who've moved from Scot uh, England, which is actually why the government <laughs> wants to use it uh, in this moment when such a hostile environment in, in the rest of the UK or with led from Westminster and they've got a policy difference here in Scotland around that approach. So they want people to move. They're not seeking, this is not for people who, to bring people who aren't already in the UK. This is actually for people who are already here and are having a really bad time and not getting their skills recognised in Wales and Northern Ireland and Ireland and, and whatever in England. Move to Scotland, use, get skills recognition and your employer will be able to support. So before we'd even launch, before I had not said to any, to, to any we obviously engaged with pharmacists, we had two people who moved who are now working in Edinburgh, one in Livingston, one in Edinburgh, in pharmacies. Yeah, this is like, so that's the policy. That's what the government kind of wants to happen. And in that way, their families come and the blah, blah, blah. So the employers themselves, which actually was you, are keen because they haven't, they want a process to help them. And here's a process. So they've been great, actually, but we haven't really because we haven't publicly launched and we're kind of developing up how best to do this it's going to fit into um the future skills strategy and the talent attraction so as those kind of formal policies go out this will become part of that 
process and will become more known and then hopefully more employers <laughs> get it. A great way to show that that's supposed to, to facilitate a welcoming society in, in Scotland to, to people who find themselves in that circumstance. So um, it's a really positive development. Last question to you, Julie, before we stop, and just because we've talked um, about examples in the other two areas, I'm just interested about what feedback you've had from users of the service uh, from the armed forces. How have they found it and how has it helped them to, to recognise their skills and to gain employment when they leave the forces? Um, so far, Alistair, we, we've only just launched it, only went live um, last week or the week before, just very oh. recently, so it's, a, it's quite recent. Um, what, we are, what we have been doing, though, is testing it with um, people who are about to leave and getting their feedback. Um, the first, we've done three lots of testing, so probably we've tested it with about um, 50 people. And um, all from different um, uh, different sides of the armed forces, so army, navy, or air force. And initially, it was tricky. Um, there was a number of bugs in the system, so we wanted to get those sorted. Um, but we we actually went into the workshops delivered by Career Transition Partnership and delivered them face to face. Um, we then, from the first one, went away, uh, made some changes. Um, a number of the challenges were finding um, qualifications because sometimes um, everybody in the armed forces has something called a JPA form, and that sets out all their qualifications that they've gained whilst in the military. What sometimes we were finding was that um, the nomenclature wasn't correct. So we were using the nomenclature that the awarding body would use on the certificate, but on the JPA form, sometimes it's been recorded as something different. So there was some of those challenges and we still have to iron some of that out. Um, I think people felt um, in answer to your question, certainly by the time we got to the third lot of testing, we've been doing some, um, uh, we've been doing some uh, tweaking and changing and, and um, sorting out some of the challenges. The third set were really straightforward and they could find what they needed pretty quickly. And anything they couldn't find, again, we were going back and just making some suggestions. So there's one or two things we still have to do, but what we would like to do um, in, say, six months' time is to really, we'll be able to look at who's going through that system and then do some kind of uh, impact review on it, but it just needs a wee bit longer. Certainly what we found from the leaflets was there was an increase in the number of uh, service leaders and veterans contacting us for advice and support which we hadn't had before but we haven't done any formal impact yet because the actual tool is so new but we will be doing that. I'm sure everyone here will look forward to hearing the developments for all three areas um, as we go forward because you're all at quite an early stage um, but it'll be really interesting to find out what real impact it's made in six months or a year's time and I'm sure we'd, we'd, we'll be looking forward to hearing and seeing that um, in the future. Um, thank you very much to everybody, to the, the three speakers, really grateful to you for doing that, to everybody else for joining. It is now time for Have a Lunch Break and we will catch you, I think it's at half past one for the rest of the programme. Really good to see you and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much everyone.